Well, let's rise as we bless the name of the Lord together. Baruch Hu Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Vaed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From the cornerstone of our faith, from Devarim Deuteronomy 6.4. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Vaed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha b'chol levovacho v'chol navshecha u'v'chol meldecha v'ayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anlochim et zavacha hayom alavavecha v'shinantam levanecha v'dibarta obam v'shiftachol b'veitecha u'v'latachol v'aderek u'v'shapaka u'v'kamecha u'ksharatom l'ot al-yadecha v'hayu l'totofod b'nei necha u'ktavtom al-mezuzot v'etecha and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as friendless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are going to worship the Lord, and uh, we're going to use the same songs as last week, so you can get to know this. And when it comes to challenges that are happening all around us, it can seem dark. It can seem like there's no way out. But there is a way that God brings in the midst of the darkness, a call to press forward and to take hold of what God has for us. And he is the one who will illuminate the night. So if it seems dark, the light is coming and God is going to manifest himself and bring illumination for all those things that we may or may not understand. And so we are going to sing noonday in the night. Only God can turn things around. Amen. Into the night, facing darkness and things we don't yet know. Still into the night, with all of our might, we now go. Oh, into the night, with darkness and fear all around. And into the night, uncertain of what will be found. Oh, yes, and into the night, your unfiltered light will abound. And with the light of your power and grace, and in the light that shines from your face, oh, into the night, filled with your light we go. Yes, into the night, filled with your light we now go. And the darkness has to flee as your light sets people free. And everyone will shine so bright Like noonday in the night 
Just like noonday in the night We go to set the captives free Open the eyes that cannot see To bring about what soon must be Like noonday in the night We shine like noonday in the night No matter what the challenge is, no matter what the darkness is, God's light can bring illumination and bring us into the right place, place of His calling help others set free we go to set the captives free open the eyes that cannot see to bring about what soon must be like noonday in the night yes like noonday in the night oh come illuminate the night and shine like noonday in the night restored by your great light like noonday in the night oh come and bring your light so we can shine so bright like noonday in the night just like noonday in the night oh yes and into the night restored by your light we now go Hashem. No matter what the challenge is, he's there for us. This was a song we did last week. It speaks of the highest calling. You know, no matter what we go through, you know, a lot of times those cobwebs, those things cause rumination. We keep thinking about them over and over again. And God says, forget what's behind. Keep moving forward into what God has for you. And he will bring us into that place that place that he's appointed for each of us, the highest calling. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards that which is before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the calling of God. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for that which is before. I press toward the prize of the highest calling of God. Whoa, I'm pressing in, I'm taking hold, I'm not turning back and I'm big. In. I'm drawing near Forsake all my past sins Forget all my fears I'm pressing on I'll take my stand I humble my heart As I take hold of your hand And I'm pressing on The highest calling of God Yeah, I'm pressing on Setting captives free I'm doing what's right And I was just in it for me I'm pressing on for the highest calling of God. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards that which is before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the calling of God. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for that which is before. I press towards the prize of the highest calling of God. Whoa, I'm pressing in, I'm taking hold, I'm not turning back and I'm big. In. I'm drawing near to save all my past sins, forget all my fears. I'm pressing on, I'll take my stand. I humble my heart as I take hold of your hand. I'm pressing on for the highest calling of God. Yeah, I'm pressing on, setting captives free. 
I'm doing what's right, not what's just in it for me. I'm pressing on for the highest calling of God. Yeah, I'm pressing on for the highest calling of God. Will you press in with me? We're pressing on. the Lord. He is so good. We have to keep pressing on. We have to keep moving forward. And he provides the impetus. He provides us the empowerment. He provides us the way to move forward into the fullness of what God has for us. That's the highest calling, to be in union with him, to be intimate with the God of all creation. And when we are, there is no limit to what God can do. You see, fear has torment, and it causes us to diminish and pull back. But God doesn't want fear. He wants to replace fear with a faith, a trust that will bring us through every circumstance. And when we talk about what we believe, it doesn't matter what the circumstances look like. God can transform every circumstance. You know, oftentimes, I've said this before, but oftentimes it isn't the circumstance itself that's the problem. It's the spin on it that makes us think it's really bad and worse than it is. But in time, we look back and what seemed to be insurmountable when we've surmounted and passed that by, it's something in the past, it's done. We're not sure how we got there, how we got through it, but he brought us through it. And we should always remember that he is faithful to bring us through every circumstance, to dispel fear and to bring us into a place where we believe we trust in, cling to, and rely on him. I believe. Anima Amnim. Anima Amnim. Anima Amnim. Oh. I believe. There's coming a day, believe, I believe, there's coming a day, when he'll receive all honor and glory and power and praise, dominion and rulership throughout every age. That their lives can be retrieved. They can humble their hearts low and seek after Him. He'll restore them through righteousness, freed from every sin. I believe that all of His word is true, and I he promised he'll bring us to Will he bring us to birth time and not deliver to what he started he'll finish with all he said he'd do I believe no matter where we may run he'll be with us I believe of all men he makes us Never deceive us. I believe what never could be oh, can be. Yes, I believe all people can be set free if we just humble our hearts low and seek after Him. He will fill us with righteousness, freed from every sin. coming a day do you believe it i believe we believe there's coming a day we 
believe we've got to believe it. I believe we believe that it's coming our day. We'll receive all honor and glory and power and praise, dominion and rulership throughout every age. God is so good, isn't he? Baruch Hashem. And Shabbat Shalom. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion. We're so glad you're here with us today. And our calling as a congregation, we repeat this every week, but this is very true. It's the core of our being. To declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. God is giving us opportunity to be able to show and declare, not just in our words, but more importantly in our actions and in our lives. Sometimes people lose sight of the fact we think nobody sees what's going on. Don't you love it when you're talking to somebody and they're saying something to you and they think they're whispering, but everybody around hears them? It's just funny how we do that. We forget where we are. But the fact is that people are reading us all the time. Uh, don't get paranoid about that. You know, there's, there's that old line that says, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's an old line. But the point is that God wants us to be living letters known and read by all people. And people are reading us, and we need to be, make sure that they're reading the pages that he wrote and not the ones we wrote, the little scribble that we make every now and then. But to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes so that the truth can set people free. And we're grateful for that opportunity. And to see this message go forth to the communities around us, to Central Jersey, and to the world. Because God wants to bring deliverance for all people. And I think that's one of the most amazing messages that God can pull from all different backgrounds, as we have evident in our congregation as well. From all different backgrounds, he brings people and has the ability by his ruach, by his spirit, to make us one people. Even though we have varieties of backgrounds, it's like a tapestry, how all of the different colors and weavings and parts come together to create something that our own personal thread alone can't do. But something about the way that the master weaver blends us together for a purpose and a plan and a visage for people to be able to see the power of God moving. And part of that power of God moving is to see how people from so many different backgrounds can come together in unity. How good it is for brothers to dwell together in unity and sisters too. There's something amazing about what God is able to, how good and how pleasant it is. And it is pleasant. And God has a way of doing all of those things. And glad that we're not in this thing alone, that we are here together for a purpose, that God has a purpose beyond geography and beyond our families and beyond just our own personal needs. Our personal needs are important, but there's something about being in position and linked together to create, like I say, that tapestry of God's creation, a blending of lives that are working to assist one another, to encourage one another, to fulfill our individual and corporate destiny. And we're grateful for all those who are a part of that with us. Avina Makeno, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word. We ask you to open up our hearts as we prepare to receive what you have for us. We ask you to bless this time and make it very special 
as we come together to worship you and to be transformed by the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Today's Torah portion is special in a few ways. We're just starting Nisan, the month of Nisan, which is the first month of the year. And it's the beginning of what else happens in this month? You're right. Passover happens in this month. But this is the beginning of the month. It's Shabbat HaChodesh, which speaks of the, the Shabbat of months. It's the month that we celebrate the first of the year, not with confetti or anything like that, but with the wonderful message of what God is birthing in his people. Now, I have up here on the screen uh, a very interesting mosaic that was done by a wonderful artist in Israel, and they actually use this as part of their image for their right to life groups over there in Israel. And so it's, it's a beautiful painting. And the title for today's message is Birthing a Nation, Birthing a Nation. I was going to put Birth of a Nation, but I was afraid that that title has a lot of bad connotations for some people. So it is Birthing a Nation, Shabbat HaChodesh. And when we look at this, the portion is called Tazria, She Conceived. And it's taken from the, there's actually a couple of Torah portions that are read during this time because the traditional portion would be this one in Leviticus 12, beginning in verse 1. And it's where it says, Hashem said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, if a woman conceives and gives birth to a boy, she will be unclean for seven days with the same uncleanness as in the Nida." When she ha is having her menstrual period on the eighth day, the baby's foreskin is to be circumcised. She is to wait 33 additional 33 days to be purified from her blood. She is not to touch any holy thing or come into the sanctuary until the time of her purification is over. But if she gives birth to a girl, she will be unclean for two weeks, as in her nida. And she is to wait another 66 days to be purified from her blood. Now, it sounds like a very kind of an unusual, technical, strange kind of passage here. But what I want to look at is a variation of what's being talked about here. It's talking about birth. She conceived. She brought forth someone. And actually, the reference that is also given, the uh, Tazria, which uh, is taken from the root word zara, which means seed. Uh, and an alternate translation might be she bears seed or in bearing seed, she conceived as, a, as opposed to just simply conceiving. There's something about the seed of faith, the seed of life that is planted within her that is birthed from her. And so one of the things that we look at with chapter 12 of Exodus at this time is kind of interesting because in Exodus 12, it says about the recapping of what is going on in the month of Nisan. Now, for those who know, the, they, they have all of these titles, these different names. And so the former name for Nisan was not Datsun. Uh, it was the first month of the year. And so uh, they went by the first month, second month, third month in Hebrew. But in the reference, uh, so just so there's no questions about that, uh, not Datsun, but Nisan. And it says here in chapter 12, and I'm going to bring these together in a special way that I think is fascinating to look at. It says in chapter 12 of Exodus, Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt. He said, you are to begin your calendar with this month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Speak to all the assembly of Israel and say on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb, a kid for his family, one per household. 
And he goes through talking about referencing on the 14th day of the month, we are to celebrate Passover and all of that. And so the beginning of this month, the first day of the month, is the beginning of Nisan. It is the beginning of the birthing of the nation of Israel. Now, it's kind of interesting. Well, Israel was already a family. They were a nation. But in reality, they were in a type of exile. They were in a, an incubation period. They were in a place of birthing. And in one sense, they were in a troubling womb. For hundreds of years, they, were, they had become slaves uh, to Egypt. And what you see with the story of Passover, as we are preparing for Passover in two weeks, when you look at what was happening, it is the birthing of the nation. And all of the contractions and all of the pain and all of the elements that were there were part of bringing forth the nation of Israel, the people of God. And to bring forth this growing community so that God could have a people in the earth, bring them to their land, and then have through their seed Messiah to come and open the gate for all people to come and experience the wonder of his miraculous birth, but then our birth as well. We're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible and in one sense, you could say that the nation, the people, were a family, a large family, a large amount of people, but they were birthed as a nation when it came to Passover. They went in and became, as a family, they served as slaves, and God brought them out by a mighty hand, and we'll be looking at that during the next couple of weeks. And in a sense, it was the birth of the nation. Because that's where they began to have their constitution, which was the Torah. That's the beginning of where Moses went into the mountain, as we saw, and brought down the tablets. And all of these different things that began to develop were part of the birthing of the nation of Israel. And in a similar fashion, we also experience a rebirth a rebirth in our own life when we ask Messiah to come in, when we come in. And what I love about this image, if you can see that image up here, um, it's, it's in the womb. It's the birthing. It is, uh, it is a safe place. Your eyes saw me before I was born. Before I was conceived, you knew me. And when you think about it, he spoke that in Jeremiah and also, even David talked about how amazingly he was made and, you know, that God knew him before he was born. And so God knows each of us also before we're born. He knows exactly what it is that he's invested in each one of us. And he wants to bring about a birthing of a new dimension of life for each one of us as we experience the life of Messiah coming and taking the form of a servant, coming through the cycle of birth itself to be aligned with us as humans, to come, to suffer, to heal, and to die, and to seek and to resurrect and be resurrected and bring that transforming work for us as we come to know him. This is all part of it, and there is this the combination that is here when we look at this, you know, you can look at some of the elements next week. It talks about starts into a little bit in this portion, talking about uh, some of the, the the leprosy that happens in fabric and objects and then in people and how God wants to cleanse and deliver us. And in a way, when you think about it, in some ways, it's like birth. It's not always so clean. It's not so um, sterile, is it? It's, you know, you've got blood and you've got uh, the, the afterbirth and all of that. And yet in the midst of all of that, there's a child that is born. When you look at all of the convulsive activities that happen, it's actually a pretty violent thing, birth, isn't it? At least for this child. We talk about, you know, in the places we don't know, 
uh, what's going to be, what's going to happen. Well, I have to think that that's got to be the most, I, I, as far as I can remember, it was so traumatic, I blanked it out. I can't even remember what it was like when that birth, it was so traumatic. First thing you do, you come out of the womb, you come out of your mom, and the first thing is, you see a doctor who, who you would think would be respectful, the guy slaps you the first thing you do when you come out. You just start crying. It, but I'm telling you, it was so traumatic, I, I can hardly remember it now. But, um, but it's, it's, you know, it, and I mean, so you think, wow, I'm comfortable in here. Everything is fine. You look at this image. Everything is fine. Why do I have to move on? But, you know, we ask the same question, don't we? When we look at circumstances, you reach a plateau, a certain place, say, I'm comfortable here. This is good. Why am I being stirred again? Why is the nest being stirred? Why can't we just settle down and just relax and enjoy what's going on? But it's not that way because God is continually birthing new things in us. He is bringing, just like in the cycle of the calendar, each month it's Rosh Chodesh. It's the, 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 the head of the month. It's the head of the year. And with, with this particular one, there's actually four different New Year's in the calendar going by the cycles of the agricultural cycles and such. But there is something about what God births in us. And if we begin to think that we've arrived, in some ways we allow ourselves to be stillborn in the new dimension of what it is God is doing, but he won't do that. He brings those contractions. He brings those elements that are there stirring us and pushing us to be able to follow in the pattern that he has and to be established in what God is doing. And that's why when we look at what it is that Messiah had accomplished for us, it's amazing to see that as we have these elements that are tied in to the birth of a child in the Torah portion and all of the cycles that are there and how many days and 33 days and 66 days and all the different things that are being talked about and the purification and all of this, it's part of what God is establishing and doing in us as he births something new in each one of us. And so God is continually conceiving in us new things. And if it's not, then we're not really following in the pattern that he has for us, are we? When we look a little bit further in some of these passages, there are some interesting circumstances. God uses circumstances to, to bring us, if you will, to the birthing canal of whatever that new phase is. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I should do this one portion here in Exodus 12 before we move on to another portion. In verse 11, he says, here is how you are to eat it, the Passover, with your belt fastened, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you are to eat it hurriedly. It is Hashem's Pesach, Passover. For that night I will pass through the land of Egypt, kill all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and animals. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And he would bring them out by a mighty hand. This was the convulsions of new birth. I don't think it's a coincidence that God uses the description of being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, and of seeing Yeshua saying to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There is something about in every phase of life, there are new birth developments that happen. Every new phase that we go through, remember in Fiddler on the Roof, <laughs> Do you remember in Fiddler on the Roof, there was a very interesting scene after he was married and stuff. And they said, they have a new addition to the family. Do you remember the first addition to the family? Remember, they were all excited, the new addition to the family. It was the sewing machine. <laughs> he was able as a tailor to be able to now do things on his own, on his own sewing machine. So there was a birth of a new entry into their household. It was a sewing machine. But, you know, there are things that come into our life that are a part of things that God is building in us. 
And we don't always know in advance what that's going to look like. Just like you assume that there will be a child when he's born to look a lot like his dad or his mom or the combination of both. But when God is birthing something in us, we want the visage of what is brought forth to emulate his face, his likeness, his purpose, his plan. And when it does, it takes on in some ways a life of its own, but it's a life that is embedded in the union that we have with him, the intimacy that we have with him. And if you look at Second Kings, it's kind of an interesting story here. I'm not going to go into the whole thing on it. You can look at this later. It's one of the Torah port- off Torah portions that are mentioned. But there was the man Naaman, who was the commander of the king uh, of Amram, uh, of his armies. And he had Sa'arot. He had leprosy. And I find this interesting that it was a child who was a servant to him, who was a Jewish little girl. It says, on the raids into Israel and territory, Amram carried away captive a little girl who became a servant to Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish my Lord could go to the prophet in Shamron. He could heal his sa'arat, his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his Lord. The girl from the land of Israel said such and such. King of Amram said, go now and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. And taking monetary elements, 600 pounds of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, he went there. And the king of Israel thought it was a setup to destroy them. How am I going to heal him? And he came and encountered Elisha, the prophet. And it was there that God brought healing. But isn't it interesting? There was also a birth pang, if you will. He said, tell him to go wash in the water and he'll be healed. And he was angry. There was no pomp and circumstance. There wasn't anything along the lines that he would expect to be to establish what it is his position required, deserved. And if he asked you to do all of these things, he said, the waters back home are much better than the waters here. Had nothing to do with the waters. But all that stirring going on in his life, all the anger and all the things that he was feeling were a part of the birth pangs of his healing process that he didn't realize was underway. And it was said, if he told you to do all kinds of things, you would do it. This is simple. Just do it and listen. The man was healed and delivered. If you will, his health was birthed out of a place of leprosy, out of a place where it was not, he wasn't healthy. And he actually told the prophet that he would, (laughs) interesting, that he would take back some of the soil from there, that he would pray to the God of Israel in his land, even though it was not the custom. Something transformative happened to him. Something that he did not go into the land to conquer, something he didn't expect happened. His whole life was changed with his healing that took place. And in one sense... His life was rebirthed, born again. Now, I'm not talking about in the sense of of salvation through Messiah, but there was something that happened there. And it's also interesting that Elijah's um, servant didn't like the fact that Elijah didn't take a payment for what he was doing, right? Or was that with Elisha? Yeah, that was Elisha, who was the servant of Elijah. So Elisha was the prophet, and Gehazi was his servant. And he got this wonderful idea that he would birth something on his own. Do you remember that? He said, how could you not, how could he not take some kind of payment from 
this man for what he did. He can't do that. And he ran after him and said, he wants a certain set of clothes. He wants this. And he graciously gave it to him. Happy to do so. But what was offered and given to him was without price. And Gehazi kind of pulled a price from it. Interesting, interesting what happened with Gehazi. He came out of it with leprosy. Interesting. The thing that the man was delivered from because he didn't follow and look at what God was birthing and understand it, he ended up having something new birthed in his life. It was a destructive kind of a thing. And he had sarat. You know, there's another thing we're looking a little bit next week too, is that sarat also carries with it the idea of not just the affliction of your flesh deteriorating from your body and stuff like that. But traditionally, it also carries with it, with it the idea of Lashon Hara, the evil tongue. That when we find ourselves saying things that we shouldn't be saying, other things of that nature, there's a deterioration of who we are. And God wants to bring new life into us as we yield ourselves to God. When you look at the passage in in. Luke, Luke 2, it describes this birth. It says in Luke 2, 22, when the time came for their purification, according to the Torah of Moses, they took him up to Yerushalayim to present him to Adonai. As it is written in the Torah of Hashem, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and also to offer a sacrifice for a pair of doves or two pigeons as required by the Torah of Hashem. And these references are to the portion that we're looking at today. These were all a part of the ritual that was going on to be able to see these things happen. Now, what's interesting is that at this time when Yeshua's mother was presenting those things in the temple like she should, making the consecration for her son Yeshua, uh, it says there was in Jerusalem a man named Shimon. This man was a tzaddik, a holy man. He was devout. He waited eagerly for God to comfort Israel. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Ruach HaKodesh that he would not die before he had seen the Messiah of Hashem. Prompted by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Yeshua to do for him what the Torah required, Shimon took him in his arms, made a baracha to God and said, Now, Hashem, according to your word, your servant is at peace as you let him go. For I have seen with my own eyes your Yeshua, your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all people, a light that will bring revelation to the Goyim, to the nations, and glory to your people Israel. Yeshua's father and mother were marveling at all the things Shimon was saying about him. Shimon blessed them and said to the child's mother, Miriam, this child will cause many in Israel to fall and to rise. He will become a sign whom people will speak against. Moreover, a sword will pierce your own heart too. All this will happen in order to reveal many people's inmost thoughts. You can imagine that here they were coming to do the ritual that was spoken of in that passage in Vayikra in Leviticus. They were dedicating their son, doing according to the precepts of what the Torah said. And now this old holy man, Shimon, has a word, prophetic word for them. He now knows that he has seen the Messiah, knew that he would see the Messiah before he died and was comforted in the fact that he could now die. And he gives this word which they didn't fully understand. But see, that day, a certain element of Messiah was birthed in Shimon because he came to the temple compelled by the Spirit for something to be birthed in him that he didn't have in mind to know what happened that day. And there he saw what his heart knew from the Ruach HaKodesh, 
would be a revelation of who Messiah was. And he saw this child and knew that he could now be at peace and go to his resting place. Certain that Messiah had come into the world. That was a powerful birthing of revelation in his life. It was the culmination of everything he had hoped for his whole life to be able to see. And he did. And he spoke these words to his parents. They were marveling at what he had said. They weren't sure what it meant. Later on, they understood. But this was something. When we fulfill the things that God says to do, he will make all of the things that he has in mind to do be brought forth and birthed in our life. And when it does, we will see things that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the hearts of men, the things that God has for us, but they're revealed by his spirit. There was also something, and I wanted to mention in, in Luke 5, where it talks about a man who had sarat, who had leprosy. It says, once when Yeshua was in one of the towns, there came a man completely covered with sarat. On seeing Yeshua, he fell on his face and begged him, Sir, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Yeshua reached out his hand, touched him, and saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately the Sarat left him. Then Yeshua warned him not to tell anyone. Instead, as a testimony to the people, go straight to the coin, the priest, and make an offering for the, your cleansing as Moses commanded. But the news about Yeshua kept spreading them all the more so that the huge crowds would gather to listen and be healed of their sicknesses. And then verse 16 is very interesting. He says, however, he, Messiah, made a practice of withdrawing to a remote place in order to pray. Nothing that we receive from God happens without our praying. And the reason I say that is because it's not that God needs us to pray to make it happen, but to prepare us to be able to understand when what is happening is happening. And as we pray and as we seek the face of God and he begins to unfold these things before us, we understand that we're already connected to these things that are coming about because he's already revealed to us in prayer. Prayer is not a time of begging God to do something. It's the place of intimacy with him where he begins to birth something in us that we're unable to fully picture or unable to fully fathom. And out of that, he brings about a transforming work in us. And part of his ability, Yeshua's ability as a man to walk the earth as, he, as we walk was that he knew that he needed to take time he knew that it was important to pray because it was in that place that he did what he saw the father doing. If we're going to do the things, we can guess at what we can do. We can guess at our calling, guess at our purpose, guess at what it is that we need to accomplish. Or we can seek the face of God. And if Messiah himself took the time to move away from the people, when with them he ministered to them without hesitation and without restraint. But then he always needed to take time as a practice of withdrawing from the crowds to a remote place in order to pray. And in the process of seeking the face of God, he was able to do what he saw the Father doing. He's able to see what the Father is doing. And see, that's the beauty of what God births in us. When his spirit comes in and transforms us, he gives us the ability and it's something like we have, that we have to exercise, the ability to see what the Father is doing, not to lean to our own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all our ways so that he can bring forth the things that he wants to do in our life. As dramatic as some of these things are, the message goes forth. He told him, follow the regulations, follow the rules, follow the pattern laid out 
by Moses. He didn't say, go around and tell everybody you were healed and, and we'll have a big healing service and come on out and give them my business card and tell them to check out my video and all this other stuff, you know. And here, here is a, a part of my clothing and go forth and touch them. with. He didn't do any of that stuff. He just said, go and fulfill the things that Moses said to do. Don't make a big deal about it. And in the process of doing that, it was solidifying for the man who was healed the understanding of what it was that came to him that he wanted healing for so long. But you know, when you don't have that healing coming, you don't have that answer to prayer, you start to become despondent maybe and wonder if it'll ever happen. And so there was that element that said, sir, if you're willing, you can heal me. He said, I'm willing, be healed. There was a reluctance. There wasn't an arrogance that said, hey, you're healing everybody, heal me. There was a humility that was there. It was born out of the tumultuous experience that he had with his uncleanness. In fact, to be there near a crowd was not something he was allowed to do. I don't even think he had a mask. He didn't stay six feet away from the Messiah or from anybody else. But he had a sense that there was something special about what was in this man who was birthed and brought forth and came as the one to bring deliverance for all people. And he experienced his healing, and he says, go and follow the procedures laid out in the Torah. I think that what that did was also solidify for him and seal for him what it was that God just did in his life. It's sort of like when we give thanks to God for what he's done. You know, we pray, Lord, bring this thing, whatever it is, and we pray for it, and we pray for it, and then it comes along, and we take it for granted and keep going on to the next thing. But there is something about having thanksgiving, having those elements that tie us to that post, that moment, that peg in the ground set by God that we look at and say, this is where it happened. You know, I'll tell you one funny story before I close. And that is years ago when I was in Bible school, we went to these different, we had to do field work semesters in a church someplace in the country. And I went to a little church in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. And they told us before, they said, now some of these places you go, they're going to be doing things different than you expect. You're not going there to, cha to change them. He says, remember one thing. And we're thinking, never back down. We're trying to figure out what it is. He says, fit in. Fit in? He says, when you fit in and you understand how they do what they do, God will open a door for you to bring forth something that will be ministering to the people. And we went there, and there was one event that happened. This is what made me think of it, too. There was one point where I'm watching. This is a wild congregation. I mean, when the Spirit of God was moving, they were doing laps in the sanctuary. They, were, they, had, they even had with the pews, they would, somebody would just start running the backs of the pews. I mean, literally going back and people moving from side to side as they went through, back to back to back, all the way back, <laughs> all these things. And I said to my, and, and then, I, then all of a sudden, this old guy who was in his late 70s, early 80s, he, was, he, would, he, he suddenly got up from his chair, climbed up on the pulpit, and jumped off. And I looked, and I said to my room, and I said, is there a story with that? He says, oh, yeah. Later, he told me the story. See, I didn't say to him, is this guy crazy? Should we take him off to an institution or something? I don't know. <laughs> but here was the story. The man had a stroke years before, 10 years earlier. And he was in a service, and he, he was paralyzed on one side of his body. And he felt like God said to him, if you climb up on the pulpit and jump off, I'll heal you. Well, he got up to the pulpit, dragged himself to the pulpit. He had no ability to get up on there, but he felt a spring, and he was on the pulpit, jumped off, hit the ground. People came over to see if he's all right. And all the paralysis was gone. He was completely healed. And when the Spirit of God would move in the service, 
He had a moment of remembrance, and it was for him, each time he did this, it was, it may have looked strange to everybody else, but he was giving thanks to God for the miracle of healing that happened 10 years earlier. And he would do this from time to time as a reminder that it was God who delivered him and instantly healed him of his stroke paralysis. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should follow suit and do the same. But I am saying this, that when it comes to anything that God does in our life, that he births in our life, don't discard what he's birthed. Don't demean what it is that's happened. But take a moment to find a secluded place, a remote place like Yeshua did after all of this ministry that he did to pray and to seek the face of God. And part of that is to give thanks for what he's done. And as we do, we reinforce what it is God is working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And as we do, we see the move of God happening and we begin to see new things birthed in our life, new things coming forth. Giving thanks to him, he brings more and more and more. That's why I say it's not just simply the birthing. But what is it that God is birthing in you? What is the vision God's put in you? What is the thing that you experience that you want so desperately to see God do? And as you seek his face and as you spend time with him, all of the different circumstances. What if that fellow Shimon had said that day, you know, my arthritis is kicking in. I don't think I'm going to go to shul today. I won't go to the temple today. I'll go tomorrow. But he felt compelled by the Spirit of God to go. And there was the answer that his heart wanted for so long. He had a sense that he would see Messiah before he died. And here he goes in there. And this amazing experience happened. He didn't go by his own understanding saying, I'm a little tired today. He went there. What about when Peter... They always talk about Peter was in the upper room and all the power of the Spirit of God moved. We'll talk about that when Shavuot comes. The one thing about the upper room experience is it didn't happen in the upper room. It says very clearly in the last verse of Luke, every day they were in the temple praising God. They weren't hiding in a room, afraid of the Romans, afraid of the Orthodox Jews. They, weren't, they were every day in the temple praising God. And when they were there on Shavuot praising God, something was birthed there as well that they didn't expect. He said, wait till you're endowed with power from on high. And they went into the temple. And while they were there, all of those things, manifestations that took place that they just read about in the Torah portion and in the Haft Torah portion, the flashes of light, all of that, when they saw that, it says that Kepha stood up the cloven tugs of fire over his head and over the head of the disciples. God gave them the floor. God put the spotlight on them. And they said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And he went on and he spoke. He could not have scheduled to speak at the temple and say, listen, Caiaphas, I'd like to come in here and do a message. But God birthed something that day, and it was the pivot point of all history. The death of resurrection of Messiah was the pivot point, but the outpouring of the Spirit and the move of the birth, we talked about birthing a nation when we see Israel come out of Egypt. But here was the birthing of the body of Messiah. Here was the birthing and the expansion, the new birth of the nation as God was pouring out his Spirit. And thousands of people responded to that. And it kept growing and excelling and moving. But what if Peter had said, I'm tired this morning. I'll go to the afternoon service if they have one. No, he had to be in the synagogue that day. He had to be in the temple that day. We have to be where God is directing us. We have to be in the place where God is is getting ready to either bless us with something that we have longed for for so long or to use us to bless somebody else. 
But there is something about being part of a body as God weaves our lives interactive with one another to bring forth something beyond what I have seen and ear has heard, beyond what we can imagine. And to watch this, how wonderful it is when someone's pregnant and you see them growing on the outside, but inside a whole new life is being birthed, is coming forth, a whole new life of possibilities. And what will their life produce? What will that life be? Time will show it and God will show it. And we need to seek his face, spend time with him, and let the work of Messiah transform us. Not just to make us transformed, but so that we can be transformed into vessels of light to go about and transform all those who we come in contact who have been in a cloud of darkness or depression and see them liberated and set free by the power of God. This is part of our calling. God is birthing things all the time in us. As traumatic as it was to be born the first time, it was very traumatic when I was born the second time when Messiah came into my life. Very traumatic. But there were other times, too, and I mentioned this before. When I was in Bible school and I said, Lord, I'm no good for you. I'm seeing things that are not there, that weren't there before. You should forget about me, and I'm going to bring shame to your name. And he said, Jan, I, thought, I, I knew those things were there before I called you, and I called you anyway. And I'll tell you, that was a birthing moment more than any other moment in my whole life. Because at that moment, I've said this before, at that moment, I understood the unconditional love of God, that there wasn't anything that was going to surprise him about me. He said, these were there before I called you. I called you anyway. And I thought, how could you call me with that in my life? And he says, there's a lot more we have to deal with, but there's a lot that I'm going to do as you yield yourself to me. And I believe that each one of us has the potential to see God do something beyond what we can ask or think or imagine. Because he wants to be the lover of our soul. He wants to make his presence known. He wants to come and make his home in us. And if he's living there, he'll make his presence known. And we'll begin to take on the visage of our father. We'll begin to take on and say, you know, you're the spitting image of your dad. <laughs> you're the spitting image of your dad. And I'm not talking about the physical image. But the elements that are his, that he imparts to us because we live with him. He lives with us. He lives in us. And as we do, we see God do great and mighty things that we know not of. Of Eno Malkano, our father and our king, we thank you that you are the one who birthed the nation of Israel. You are the one who brings new birth into our lives. You are the one who brings the purposes and the plans of your heart to full fruition as we yield ourselves to you. And Lord, we thank you for the price that you paid for our liberation and our freedom, the price that you paid so that we could be set free and brought into a new dimension of relationship with you and with all those around us. And Lord, we ask you never to let us just think that what you do for us is for us alone, but so that we can be reconciled to you and then be given access to the ministry of reconciliation to see others experience your powerful impartation to each one. Make us pregnant with possibilities. Make us to birth forth those things that you put into our life, that little seed of faith, that element that is there to birth it in us, oh God, and bring forth transformation in the world around us. Lord, we thank you for the amazing calling that you have in our lives, individually and collectively. And help us to understand that we are not standing, that no man is an island, as they say, that there is something about coming together and working for a common cause that is set by your hand and by your voice alone, oh God. Help us to hear that still small voice. Help us to be where we're supposed to be to hear your call and to hear your plan and see it unfold before us as we yield ourselves to you. For those who don't know Messiah, Lord, 
bring the revelation of Messiah deep into each heart, that they would be able to experience the wonder of what it is to know you, that it is not religion. It's not man-made rituals, but it is an intimate one-on-one relationship that opens up our heart to all the one-on-one people that are out there with you so that we see the body come together like lively stones fit together by the architect, you as the architect, in building something beyond what we could ever build ourselves. Thank you for letting us participate in all these things. And thank you for this amazing plan of wholeness, of redemption, of salvation. Thank you, Father, in Yeshua's name. And let's all stand as we close with the ironic benediction. I want to encourage you to really seek the face of God. You know, I'll tell you this one thing, too. If you're sitting around waiting for God to work and do, you're not really waiting on God you're actually delaying things. How do you make it come faster? Seek him. Draw near to him. In the process, he will begin to unfold those things that don't make sense to us at different times and knit together exactly what it is he's doing. And we'll be able to see more clearly what God wants to produce in us and um, not to try to do it in our own strength. Anyway, as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. Thank you so much for coming out. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you in Shul.